I'm Betty Johnson, Assistant Dean for Faculty and Staff Diversity, Development and Leadership at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, where we are committed to solving serious health and social problems facing the world. Our success in addressing these issues has huge implications for the future. No factor is more important to this pursuit than outstanding leaders. Therefore, the goal of Voices in Leadership is to highlight the experiences of those confronting these major challenges and to better understand what effective leadership is and how it can affect change. We believe these lessons and insights should be shared widely and thank you for joining us today. Good afternoon and welcome to Voices in Leadership. My name is Eric Anderson and I'm the Deputy Director of this program and I have the privilege to introduce our very special guest. Dr. Samsak Chun Harris is a Mentral Senior Leadership Fellow at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He formerly served as Deputy Minister of Health for Thailand and is currently President of National Health Foundation, an NGO promoting and coordinating evidence-based health policy. Throughout his career, Dr. Samsak directed several offices of the Ministry of Public Health, focusing on international health, health policy, international collaboration, and health manpower development. Dr. Samsak also pioneered a team that led to various health reform initiatives over the last 30 years and the development of the Thai universal health care system. Dr. Samsak started his career as a physician and director in community hospitals in rural Thailand before shifting to international health and health planning. Before I turn the session over to today's interviewer, Dr. Ashish Shah, the director of the Harvard Global Health Institute, please join me as we welcome Dr. Samsak to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you. So Samsak, thank you for being here. Um, I, it is an honor and a privilege to have you not just for today's session, but visiting us as a mentor fellow. And I think uh, the students and the faculty are excited to learn from you. Um, let, me, let me get started by asking you to talk a bit about your personal journey. You are a physician. Mm -hmm. You began. Uh, practicing and, and working in rural Thailand. Yes. And you go from that to really being one of the key players in enabling universal health coverage in Thailand to really the global stage where you are, I think, uh, it would not be an exaggeration to say that your advocacy is one of the reasons why UHC has become such a high priority. What does that journey look like for a doctor in rural Thailand to get, getting to this global stage? How did you get there? What motivated you? What, how did that feel as, as you progressed on that path? Thank you for the question, uh, because I think it would be interesting also for students of public health. I started as a physician, as you say, you know, but uh, I happened to grow up in Thailand in the time when we were asked to serve for three years in the rural area. I decided to do that, even though I, you know, firstly wanted to be a scientist, a teacher. But anyway, I served in the rural area uh, and choose to be the, mini the man managers of uh, district hospitals, partly because I wanted to learn something about public health and mm -hmm. try to see how I could work better with the community, being a physician. And of course, uh, you know, that served the purpose because around that time, Thailand was also uh, supporting the development of district health systems, all although we have just started. So I learned about many things, including how you could try to design and defend for a community hospital to be more integrative about preventive and mm. curative services. And of course, I, I also was you know, quite good in my uh, in, uh, foreign language. I could speak English quite well. So my boss in the, in the rural area you know, kind of spotted me. So when he moved to the central ministry, he asked me to join him and work with WHO. And that's where I started also to learn a bit more about much broader issues on global health and how you manage uh, bigger systems and bigger problems and then as uh, Eric has introduced I have the chance to move in various uh, divisions and in particular for UHC is a very interesting story as well because being in the uh, division of planning we have the opportunity or the duty to kind of monitor things around and Thailand also has quite visionary leaders uh, one of the permanent secretary at that time, one of my, the boss at whom I uh, respected a lot, Dr. Amon Nantasutu, pioneer primary health care in Thailand as well, gave us a study from an American econo health economist saying that healthcare spending in Thailand has been escalating 
uh, increasing at a uh, rate rapid, more rapid than the growth in GDP. And at that time, GDP growth in Thailand is 10%. So we are growing, the health expenditure is uh, increasing rapidly at 14%, 15%. Wow. He said, you know, I don't know what, what to do about it. You are the younger generation, so you <laughs> have a look and see what you can do about it. And it happened again that, you know, I, as I say, we, we were the compulsory service uh, doctors. So at that time, lots of uh, people go to the rural area. So I came to, the, to work in the central ministry, not alone. Many of my colleagues who also used to serve in the rural area also came and joined the central ministry more or less at the same time. So I had a chance to, to, to kind of organize a group of interest. We happened to have a very good mentor. Mm. who is a professor in medicine who would believe in public health and believe in health system development. So we get together as a group and we study health economics. We try to do many things. We work with WHO also with after WHO support. And gradually we learn about many things beyond health economics. We learn about healthcare financing at the, at the time when WHO is also opening up. I came to Boston here mm. to be you to study a course in you know, financing healthcare in developing countries in 1988. So, you know, it was, it was a, a journey, but mostly through an interest in the so-called uh, technical aspects. And of course, I had the chance to lead the Health System Research Institute, which was established 25 years ago, through some of these so-called, you know, studies and learning in uh, health system and policy research. So we decided to have, and the minister at that time decided to have the institute, because he also believed that we need to have some, you know, uh, good institution to try to study this more in depth. Around the same time, we have the social security systems. We learn from the ILO who have been promoting social security system. One of my colleague, Dr. Sungwon Nitya uh, Rampong, who is actually the real pioneer. Mm. He is a, so, uh, what you call, policy entrepreneur who makes things happen, talking to the politicians, convincing him that you know, he should launch a policy. But that was some, some time later, 14 years ago. But around the same, the, the same time that we have the Self System Research Institute, we try to do studies and we learn from the social security system. We look at the existing uh, insurance of the civil servants and found many interesting findings. And of course, we work with different international colleagues. I think Bill Shao here also used to be with us in Thailand in one of the World Bank uh, supported conference on the Thai uh, healthcare financing. And so, you know, things grow. I was happy to, uh, I was uh, lucky to be a part of that, that group, you know, learning and de developing. Before the final version, I should tell you this one, yeah. because this, this is an interesting story from many of us from academic background. My, my colleague, as I told you, who has been very you know, passionate about moving forward the UHC in Thailand, developed three different versions of how we could have the so-called universal health coverage in Thailand. And I was always telling people that we were very lucky that the government before that didn't accept the so-called minor version, the one that we had happened to be the most significant version. Anyway, that, I'll, I'll, I'll wait. Well, so let me, let me gently push back on your notion that you were lucky um, in these. Because it strikes me, as I heard you tell your story, of a couple of things, and I'm hoping you might be able to expand on them. One is you were already trained as a physician. Mm -hmm. And when you were asked to take on and look at these issues, you didn't stop by saying, well, I'll use my medical training. You came to Boston to get more training. You began working with. Talk about that as a enabling factor for leadership. That when you are confronted with new issues that are outside of your area of scope and expertise, you might already have a doctoral yeah. degree. The notion that of of lifelong yeah. learning, of using and learning new skills, because that strikes me as not about luck, but about willingness no, I, to I, learn. I think you you are very right on that part. I, I think I will I will tell you three things. First of all, about how I became a minister. I never wanted to be a minister. <laughs> I never wanted to be a politician. Actually, I hate politicians as, as a student. <laughs> as a student, I was By the way, we're alive, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> anyway, no, no, generically, generically. <laughs> I'm not talking about Thailand or you know, the States or whatever. But you know, the, 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 the point is that uh, when you are a student, you, you, you learn many things, but you also wanted to believe in, you know, people's power. At that time, that was, that was the time. But I'm, I'm saying this because I changed my mind. Not because I changed, but I changed the way I look at the world. And I think that's important. Hmm. And one of the lessons that I learned, as you, as you have pointed out, in my so-called long journey, having to do research, uh, talking, about pe talking to people about policy and system change, 
I find it's not something very easy. And one thing that you have to learn is to try to uh, make sure that you can work with people that you don't like. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the very important lessons that I got. And I believe that you know, many leaders have to make such important decisions every day. Yeah. Because you don't get to work with people that you like every day as a, as a leader. Yeah. But the second thing that I think would be very important is that this doesn't come about because I'm good, but because I had my enabling environment, as you say, and the team, the mentor has been very important. I would say that any one of my members in the group could become a minister if they, if they like, if they're in the, in the opportunity to do that. But of course, many of us uh, make also their explicit decisions about many things in, in, that, in that aspect. So the enabling environment, enabling group would be also very, very important. And of course, the last thing that I so personally believe is that you can't grow yourself without learning all the time. And you learn from your experiences, you learn from your, from your actions. And your actions, of course, is dictated partly by your academic background or your technical background. But you, you get to learn a lot from your, from your real life. Not only about you know, working with people you don't like, but about how to make things differently how to reformulate, how to redesign, how to recommunicate, because not that you, you, you could have a fixed idea or have a ready-made uh, solutions and then you can hope to succeed. You adapt all the time. I think this trait, this idea of the constant learning is one where um, physicians, and I speak as, as a physician to another, is that on one hand, I think we are um, very comfortable with this idea that you're constantly having to learn to yeah. update your knowledge. Um, but I think in some ways we've been resistant to then learning outside of our field, um, outside of yeah. medicine into economics, into yeah. sociology. into. Um, did that feel difficult for you to, to take a course on, on financing, <laughs> uh, to, to, to get out of really your comfort yeah, zone yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Um, and, and, and learn a whole new field? You know, one of the things that I did, which could be very crazy, is that I ventured to different uh, areas that I'm not familiar with. You know, not with confidence, but did with curiosity. Yeah. And then sometimes I make a lot of mistakes in, in, in on the way. I mean, I would say what I what I believe. Economics would be the same thing. You know, I could tell you a lot of things about how I talk to the economists, or I talk to the so-called the legist, the so-called the lawyers, or the expert in laws, and I talk to the uh, political, political scientists, social scientists, and they disagree with me and I disagree with them. But of course, that, that's the way you learn. Yeah. So very briefly, I would say that you should not be limiting yourself. You should be brave enough to venture into different fields. And you should also be brave enough to express yourself, of course, positively, not too negatively. Don't be too critical to, uh, negatively to, to the people you talk to. But you talk about issues, you talk about the principles, you talk about what you could get. I think that, that's, that's what happened. So about, com about comfort, I think you get more and more comfortable by doing that, not by, not by just, just listening. And you know, I have to agree with you that in, in my personal journey through that, that's one of the parts that I have actually uh, enjoyed a lot. Yeah, and, and I like your use of the word curiosity as a, as a driver of that, not just, oh, I have to learn this because it's important for policy. But there's a curiosity behind but that. But let me, let me, you know, I, I'm not good at English, but, you know, curiosity could, could, could make you feel at this, you learn it because you wanted to know. But you, you don't just want to know. You want to know to do something. Mm -hmm. Curiosity doesn't stop at being, you know, informed. Yep. It stops when you try to also apply what, what, you, what you have learned to make change happen. So I think curiosity has to link with action. Yeah. And that's another part that, you know, come back to this, to this journey. I would say that the, the, the readiness to go into action is also something that I learned mm -hmm. as, I, as I was working. One of the action, of course, as I, as I told you, is to engage in, uh, in argument, in, in dialogue, in, in learning, disagreeing, things like that. But the other thing is that you, you learn from, from your action. You make decisions, you make suggestions, and you learn from that. You could be making wrong suggestions. Somebody may believe you, but then you learn and then you, you know, recalculate. And I think, you know, we have been talking about the, the, the part where USC happened. But after USC happened over the last 13, 14 years, that's actually something that has been happening all the time. Yeah. I mean, I, as I said, you know, our group didn't stop by just being happy when the minister, when the prime minister then 
agreed to have the USC. The group continue to follow. I continue to follow. I work in the National Foundation monitoring the systems. And then uh, at one point, you know, talking about getting to, to the ministerial post, I presume that because you are engaged in public affairs so much, so that you make people know about you, you make your voices heard, you people know about your your stances. And in Thailand, we believe also in the so-called comprehensive health. So we don't stop with health services. So many of us go into the so-called health Thailand reform, mm -hmm. something that happened about seven years ago, which is much more comprehensive because we believe in equity in, in the Thai society and equity is a part of so-called good health as well. So we went into that. So I had the chance to be a part of that uh, so-called uh, active movement in the society as well. So maybe that, that's how you, you, you keep doing the right thing and maybe you know, some days you have to change your role. Right. So let me ask you a question on that. And I have two places I want to go. One is I want to talk a bit more about UHC, but we can come back to that in a minute. One of the things you said was the idea of learning from action. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we find in, in leaders, one of the challenges and struggles that a lot of leaders have is once they feel like they've made a decision and they've made a commitment to go down a certain path, even if that decision turns out to not be right, um, they feel obligated to defend it, to support it, to stick yeah, with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, no, no. Because it's very hard to admit, and yeah. it's very hard to learn from your mistakes, mm, mm. especially when you're doing it very publicly. Mm, mm, mm. So uh, what was your experience with that, uh, assuming that your track record wasn't 100% right? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And how? Do you, and what advice do you give to people who used good evidence, used the best intentions, made the right, what well, looked like the right decision at the time, but it turned out not so good? Mm. Um, how, how do you get over the personal challenge mm. of feeling like, oh, I made a mistake, in a public sphere to learn from that? Mm. Uh, let me start when when I was uh, the minister. I think being a minister, you are even more prone to defending yourself, but. Again, you know, I was fortunate to be a minister at the, at the time when I was already uh, 64 years. So I learned a lot about not trying to defend yourself. <laughs> I have learned to be a bit humble and a bit, uh, you know, attentive to other people's uh, feedback. So I, di I didn't argue, argue openly when people criticize what I have been doing, which could be a wrong thing to do as a, as a good politician because you also always look, you know, strong and things like that. <laughs> but that, that, that's a part. But you know, you are very right when, when, you, when you didn't realize that you should not be doing that. You kept doing it. And I had my, my time, you know, younger, then I kept defending my position unnecessarily. And of course, uh, you, you, you learn from that. You learn from that. Then, you know, sometimes when you, want, let me give you an example. Oh. I used to believe that we should not have universal health coverage in Thailand. Hmm. Partly because we had, don't have the capability to control the the, the, the beast, <laughs> I mean, yeah. opening up the Pandora box, yeah. something like that. Of course, I, I, I have been talking to a lot of people about that. When, I, when a colleague was contemplating this, I was giving him a lot of so-called cautious advices. But of course, the moment that the Pandora box was open in, in Thailand, I learned yeah. in a few years' time that, well, maybe I was over-cautious, I was over-concerned. Mm. And I started to shift my my way of looking at things, and I, I started defending it rather than you know right. criticizing it. Right. You know, from 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 this. So that that's something that you you also. But of course, it, people could say that why why did you change? One of the things that I believe is that if you change because you see the public benefit, then you can defend the public benefit. That's fine. Nobody could could criticize you for being you know. Yeah. Uh, what should you say? Not stick to the principle or not you know, whatever the words that people use to, to try to make you feel bad when you change your mind. Yeah. It is, it is remarkable that, I mean, we want our leaders to change their minds when the situation changes, right? The world looks different. Yeah. But it is very hard for people because they feel they yeah. get, they've gotten wedded oh, to a decision. Um, I've come to universal health coverage because it is the topic of the moment in many ways in global health. Yep. And it is, and I say that, watching Dr. Tedros, our new director general, who has made this his number yeah. one agenda yeah. item. Yeah. Um, given all of the challenges that the world is facing, given all the challenges that Thailand is facing, is that really the right investment? Is that really the right place to put energy and focus and, and limited resources into universal health coverage? Mm -hmm. what, what, 
make the case that that is. Okay, let me give you two, two I, I may help Dr. Tedros in a way, but anyway, also, also reflecting my, my personal view about that. The first thing is that I saw universal health coverage as a continuation of uh, primary health care mm -hmm. in the sense that it is a way to create better equity. But the other part is that, you know, the equity, the, to, in order to achieve equity in the health system, <coughs> things change because health care cost is now a major concern. A lot of people could get, you know, bankrupt, put into trouble because of the health care cost. Yep. Of course, 30 years ago when they started primary health care, that may not be the, the issue. So you could talk about, you know, extending primary health care services infrastructure. But now you have to talk about how, you, how we spend money or even how we try to regulate the way we, or moderate the way we spend money for health. Yeah. And of course, with aging society in Thailand, we are having a lot of challenge how people would die in a dignified way. So I believe that you know, equity and user health coverage, especially the financing dimension, is something that countries could be, could, could, should, be, should be working on. And there are lots of things to learn from. If you ask about WHO, I presume that you know, we certainly need some kind of a mechanisms to help countries to learn from each other better, to think together so that we could you know, you know, move the world as a whole. The world needs some kind of collective leadership as well, yeah. you know, not only at the country level. And that is a good role for WHO. That I believe so. Yeah, I believe and that so. cross-national You know, and then come back to this point, uh, I think one of the lessons that we learned also from a leadership perspective in Thailand about yeah. UHC is what you could call collective leadership. But I, I, love, I love to call that uh, participatory leadership. So explain that, because collective leadership sounds like a contradiction in terms. I mean, yep. we think of leadership, yep. Yep. great leaders, yep. and then we think of collective action. Mm. So what's collective leadership? Well, you know, as I say, I, I, that's why I don't like that term very much. Uh, the same as I don't like the new term that I'm, I'm trying to promote, which is participatory leadership. Uh, first of all, all, deci all decisions have to be made by an individual or a group, you know. But someone has to be so-called held accountable. But the point is that if you have a decision made by someone in a so-called position and you leave it only to them, it certainly is not enough. You have to have some other people pitch in. And you pitch in seeing yourself as leader as well. Hmm. And so you have to be able to exert your leadership. And your leadership would certainly be different from the leadership of the one who are supposed to be making that, that decision. What I was trying to say is that at least from the Thai experiences in UHC. We don't wait for someone to be enlightened. Someone who believes that they think they have something interesting. Also, don't just wait for the opportunity to happen. They proactively try to promote, try to communicate. To me, that's some kind of leadership as well. Of course, they, might, they may not get to make the decision, but they can get to do many things, influencing decision makers. Mm. And as I said, you know, there were so many versions. So we have gone through the process of influencing so many groups of people. Then, when things happen, you need another kind of leadership, the implementation level. Mm. You can never have a blueprint for a UHC drafted out in detail and then you know, communicate it down. A lot of things have to, has to happen because somebody else took up the leadership to translate it to make it happen, and that's happened in Thailand. Hmm. I would say that the Thai USC would not have happened uh, at, you know, to the extent that I changed my mind. If not, if not because of the leadership at the implementation level, yeah. the provincial level, the district hospital, the people at the peripheral, they all try to interpret because they agree. They believe with the, with the, in the principle that they should be protecting you know, the people from financial bankruptcy. They should try to achieve better equity. And, but that's, that's the value that the leadership, top leadership uh, you know, kind of you know, filter down. Yeah. But the actual implementation is up also to them. So I always say that you know, have at least five groups in the Thai that makes the Thai USC came about and then, of course, continue at the, at the, in, in, into the future. Of course, you don't, you don't disagree with the need for the top leadership, politicians most of the time. Of course, you don't disagree with the top leadership in the bureaucratic system, at least in the Thai context. Yeah. They, 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 it matters a lot. They could be arguing, they could, not, they could be disagreeing. And of course, you have the implementation level people. So these are the people who have to take actions. But the other two influencer, which is very important, is the policy entrepreneur, the evidence mm -hmm. generation, evidence translation. 
the more technocrat people, the kind of role that have been playing, that you might have also be playing. And of course, the civil society, who have to make sure that they, they are the one who tell the politicians, whoever make the, 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 the decision, that this is something that we, that we think we believe or we have benefited from, rather than just leave it to the politicians to, to, to decide what is good for you. So that, that, that's how I see it. So that is a very hopeful vision of leadership, and especially, I would say, in countries that are suffering from political leaders at the national level that we feel are not necessarily addressing the most important issues. Um, it sounds like so much of leadership from civil society, from the policy world, is about creating the context and creating the pressure to get both the bureaucratic and the political leaders to act and to to respond in a certain but I, way. But I, I hope that I'm not talking on, from a theoretical point of view. No, I, I think there's a very a, specific example as, we can be yeah. thinking about right now. As, as I say, you know, yeah. this is something that you could you could be doing and make it happen through yeah. many, many aspects. Yeah. One of the things that I talked to one of my students who came, you know, after the class yesterday, he said, yeah, I'll wait until I became the minister like you to make it happen in my country. I said, no, 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 don't wait for that. You can make it happen, <laughs> even though you're not a minister, because you may not get to be the minister on, on, on first place, but many things will happen not because you are the minister, but because many are the leadership that you have you know, learned and, and tried to express. You know. yeah. It has struck me, and I was listening to Gina McCarthy, was the head of our environmental agency for several years, and she talks about how so much of the national decisions are not because the leader wakes up one morning and says, yeah. I'm going to do this, but because the leader wakes up one morning and says, I have no choice but to do this, <laughs> because the environment around that leader has been created in such a way yeah. that they, you can push people into And that, that's what I mean by part, uh, participatory leadership. In other words, other people pitch in, yes. not waiting for uh, them to be invited by the top leaders. One last question about UHC, just as we wrap up here. Um, and this is a, one of the online questions that, that came through that I think is, is really important, um, which is, so. Again, we have this big focus now on UHC. Um, are you optimistic that this is going to be something that is going to uh, really spread globally? And then how do you deal with the fact that as countries um, get wealthier, as expectations rise, UHC will have to respond to more and more of that beast that you talked about, mm -hmm. awakening. Um, give us a forecast into the future of where this is going. Okay, very briefly, I believe that the value if not the specific goals of UHC, would certainly be attractive for countries to pursue, at least politically. In other words, people want politicians to create a system that care for them, equity, protecting them. Uh, although the way they, they, they did things would be, would be quite different. On Thailand in, 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 in particular, specifically, I think there are many challenges because uh, it's not very, very easy. You need a lot of so-called strong leadership from the system uh, manager, if I may say that. I, I use the word system governing, but I mean also other, many other groups in the, in the society to pitch in. And one particular point is about people's demand. And I think that that's, that is something that, uh, frankly speaking, you need lots of so-called effective communication between the top leaders. If you do politics as usual, if you want to please only the people and you try to say that, you know, I conform with this and that of your demand, that, that will, that's going to be the, the, dead, the dead end. Yeah. So I believe that, you know, if you are in a government, if you are minister of health, you have to be able to communicate to the people that, yeah, we are going in this together. We will do it as best as we can. Maybe just like a CEO of a company, we have to tell their employees that, you know, we are facing difficulties, so let's reduce your salary, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> well, it's, it's not happened yet, but <laughs> I mean, at least in the Thai context of yes. Thai UHC, but I believe that that's one of, the, one, of the, one of the way that you need to think about, you know, UHC. It's not an open-ended yeah. uh, kind of things where, you know, you meet all kinds of demand. It, it strikes me that, that the example you give on Thai UHC uh, could be a UHC almost anywhere, and certainly in the United States, which has been on this journey and then since the Affordable Care Act mm. in 2010. Um, we have expanded coverage. We still have about 8-9% of the population without coverage. Um, and it really, watching the Thai experience reminds me that, that this is really a long-term journey. Oh, it is, and the need for leadership doesn't go away because you have a president in the White House mm. who believes in yeah, this yeah. and doesn't go away when you have a president in the White House mm. who's trying to sabotage this. Exactly. 
you need leadership at all levels to push the agenda forward. And that is not, that's not just a Thai thing, not just a US no. thing. We see that in the UK, we see that really around the globe. Yeah. Um, and I think Thailand has been a very powerful example of how to do that well, um, but, but the lessons are, are ongoing. Um, as we finish up, let me just make a couple of remarks and then I'll, I'll, I'll let you finish. It, it strikes me listening to your journey, watching the journey of UHC in, in, in Thailand, um, one of the key lessons for the students, one of the key lessons for me, is that education and training is never done. And you're not just updating your own knowledge base. It often requires curiosity to get out of your field, uh, to learn, to engage with experts. Um, but it doesn't mean you have to go out and get a PhD in every other field, but, have, but you have to know enough to engage, uh, to engage in a more meaningful way. And the other part is this idea of the collective participatory leadership. Um, which, listening to you, it's not just about the leader going out and yes, soliciting yeah. input, no, no. right? It's about various types yeah, of leaders exactly. engaging and yeah. at times fighting it out to try yeah, to come up with yeah, what's the yeah. right approach. Yeah. I use the term positive, positively disruptive behavior. <laughs> well, I think um, as a lot of countries, I think certainly our nation is going through some substantial leadership challenges. and. Um, and the way you have thought about this and the way you have led the work, not just for Thailand, but globally, has been uh, incredibly valuable. So thank you for your leadership. Um, thank you for taking time today thank to you. speak thank you to very us. Much. It's my honor. Uh, and thank you for being here at the Harvard Chan School. Yeah, thank you very much.